This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, contact LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, October 1907, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 23, by Mark Twain. Dictated March 9, 1906. I am talking of a time sixty years ago and upwards. I remember the names of some of those schoolmates, and, by fitful glimpses, even their faces rise dimly before me for a moment, only just long enough to be recognized, then they vanish. I catch glimpses of George Robards, the Latin pupil, slender, pale, studious, bending over his book and absorbed in it, his long, straight black hair hanging down below his jaws like a pair of curtains on the side of his face. I can see him give his head a toss and flirt one of the curtains back around his head to get it out of his way, apparently, really to show off. In that day it was a great thing among the boys to have hair of so flexible a sort that it could be flung back in that way, with a flirt of the head. George Robards was the envy of us all for there was no hair among us that was so competent for this exhibition as his, except perhaps the yellow locks of Will Bowen and John Robards. My hair was a dense ruck of short curls, and so was my brother Henry's. We tried all kinds of devices to get these crooks straightened out, so that they would flirt, but we never succeeded. Sometimes by soaking our heads, and then combing and brushing our hair down tight and flat to our skulls, we could get it straight, temporarily, and this gave us a comforting moment of joy. But the first time we gave it a flirt, it all shriveled into curls again, and our happiness was gone. John Robards was the little brother of George. He was a wee chap with silky golden curtains to his face, which dangled to his shoulders and below, and could be flung back ravishingly. When he was twelve years old, he crossed the plains with his father amidst the rush of the gold-seekers of forty-nine and I remember the departure of the cavalcade when it spurred westward. We were all there to see and to envy, and I can still see that proud little chap sailing by on a great horse with his long locks streaming out behind. We were all on hand to gaze and envy when he returned, two years later, in unimaginable glory, for he had travelled. None of us had ever been forty miles from home, but he had crossed the continent. He had been in the gold-mines, that fairyland of our imagination, and he had done a still more wonderful thing. He had been in ships, in ships on the actual ocean, in ships on three actual oceans. For he had sailed down the Pacific and around the Horn among icebergs and through snowstorms and wild wintry gales, and had sailed on and turned the corner and flown northward in the trades, and up through the blistering equatorial waters, and there, in his brown face were the proofs of what he had been through. We would have sold our souls to Satan for the privilege of trading places with him. I saw him when I was out on that Missouri trip four years ago. He was old then, though not quite so old as I, and the burden of life was upon him. He said his granddaughter, twelve years old, had read my books and would like to see me. It was a pathetic time, for she was a prisoner in her room and marked for death and John knew that she was passing swiftly away, twelve years old, just her grandfather's age when he rode away on that great journey with his yellow hair flapping behind him. In her I seemed to see that boy again. It was as if he had come back out of that remote past and was present before me in his golden youth. Her malady was heart disease, and her brief life came to a close a few days later. Another of those schoolboys was John Garth. He became a prosperous banker and a prominent and valued citizen, and a few years ago he died, rich and honored. He died. It is what I have to say about so many of those boys and girls. The widow still lives, and there are grandchildren. In her pantalette days and my barefoot days she was a schoolmate of mine. I saw John's tomb when I made that Missouri visit. Her father, Mr. Kirkeval, had an apprentice in the early days when I was nine years old, and he had also a slave-woman who had many merits. But I can't feel very kindly or forgivingly towards either that good apprentice-boy or that good slave-woman, for they saved my life. One day, when I was playing on a loose log, which I supposed was attached to a raft, but it wasn't, it tilted me into Bear Creek. 
and when I had been under water twice and was coming up to make the third and fatal descent, my fingers appeared above the water, and that slave woman seized them and pulled me out. Within a week I was in again, and that apprentice had to come along just at the wrong time, and he plunged in and dived, pawed around on the bottom, and found me, and dragged me out and emptied the water out of me, and I was saved again. I was drowned seven times after that before I learned to swim, once in Bear Creek, and six times in the Mississippi. I do not now know who the people were who interfered with the intentions of a providence wiser than themselves, but I hold a grudge against them yet. When I told the tale of these remarkable happenings to Rev. Dr. Burton of Hartford, he said he did not believe it. He slipped on the ice the very next year and sprained his ankle. Will Bowen was another schoolmate, and so was his brother Sam, who was his junior by a couple of years. Before the Civil War broke out, both became St. Louis and New Orleans pilots. Both are dead long ago. Dictated March 16, 1906. We will return to those schoolchildren of sixty years ago. I recall Mary Miller. She was not my first sweetheart, but I think she was the first one that furnished me a broken heart. I fell in love with her when she was eighteen and I was nine, but she scorned me and I recognized that this was a cold world. I had not noticed that temperature before. I believe I was as miserable as even a grown man could be. But I think that this sorrow did not remain with me long. As I remember it, I soon transferred my worship to Artemisia Briggs, who was a year older than Mary Miller. When I revealed my passion to her, she did not scoff at it. She did not make fun of it. She was very kind and gentle about it. But she was also firm, and said she did not want to be pestered by children. And there was Mary Lacey. She was a schoolmate, but she also was out of my class because of her advanced age. She was pretty wild and determined and independent. But she married and at once settled down and became in all ways a model matron, and as highly respected as any matron in the town. Four years ago she was still living, and had been married fifty years. Jimmy McDaniel was another schoolmate. His age and mine about tallied. His father kept the candy shop, and he was the most envied little chap in the town, after Tom Blankenship, Huck Finn. For although we never saw him eating candy, we supposed that it was nevertheless his ordinary diet. He pretended that he never ate it, and didn't care for it, because there was nothing forbidden about it. There was plenty of it, and he could have as much of it as he wanted. He was the first human being to whom I ever told a humorous story, so far as I can remember. This was about Jim Wolfe and the cats and I gave him that tale the morning after that memorable episode. I thought he would laugh his teeth out. I had never been so proud and happy before, and have seldom been so proud and happy since. I saw him four years ago when I was out there. He wore a beard, gray and venerable, that came halfway down to his knees, and yet it was not difficult for me to recognize him. He had been married fifty-four years. He had many children, and grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and also even posterity, they all said, thousands. Yet the boy to whom I had told the cat story when we were callow juveniles was still present in that cheerful little old man. Artemisia Briggs got married not long after refusing me. She married Richmond, the stonemason, who was my Methodist Sunday-school teacher in the earliest days, and he had one distinction which I envied him. At some time or other he had hit his thumb with his hammer, and the result was a thumbnail which remained permanently twisted and distorted and curved and pointed like a parrot's beak. I should not consider it an ornament now, I suppose, but it had a fascination for me then, and a vast value, because it was the only one in the town. He was a very kindly and considerate Sunday-school teacher, and patient and compassionate, so he was the favorite teacher with us little chaps. In that school they had slender, oblong, pasteboard blue tickets, each with a verse from the Testament printed on it, and you could get a blue ticket by reciting two verses. By reciting five verses you could get three blue tickets, and you could trade these at the bookcase and borrow a book for a week. I was under Mr. Richmond's spiritual care every now and then for two or three years, and he was never hard upon me. I always recited the same five verses every Sunday. He was always satisfied with the performance. He never seemed to notice that these were the same five foolish virgins that he had been hearing about every Sunday for months. I always got my tickets and exchanged them for a book. They were pretty dreary books, for there was not a bad boy in the entire bookcase. 
They were all good boys and good girls and drearily uninteresting, but they were better society than none, and I was glad to have their company and disapprove of it. Twenty years ago Mr. Richmond had become possessed of Tom Sawyer's cave in the hills three miles from town, and had made a tourist resort of it. In 1849, when the gold-seekers were streaming through our little town of Hannibal, many of our grown men got the gold fever, and I think that all the boys had it. On the Saturday holidays in summertime we used to borrow skiffs whose owners were not present, and go down the river three miles to the cave hollow, Missourian for valley, and there we staked out claims and pretended to dig gold, panning out half a dollar a day at first, two or three times as much later, and by and by whole fortunes, as our imaginations became inured to the work. Stupid and unprophetic lads, we were doing this in play and never suspecting. Why, that cave hollow and all the adjacent hills were made of gold, but we did not know it. We took it for dirt. We left its rich secret in its own peaceful possession, and grew up in poverty, and went wandering about the world struggling for bread, and this because we had not the gift of prophecy. That region was all dirt and rocks to us, yet all it needed was to be ground up and scientifically handled, and it was gold. That is to say, the whole region was a cement mine, and they make the finest kind of Portland cement there now, five thousand barrels a day, with a plant that cost two million dollars. For a little while Ruel Gridley attended that school of ours. He was an elderly pupil. He was perhaps twenty-two or twenty-three years old. Then came the Mexican War, and he volunteered. A company of infantry was raised in our town, and Mr. Hickman, a tall, straight, handsome athlete of twenty-five, was made captain of it, and had a sword by his side and a broad yellow stripe down the leg of his gray pants and when that company marched back and forth through the streets in its smart uniform, which it did several times a day for drill, its evolutions were attended by all the boys whenever the school hours permitted. I can see that marching company yet, and I can almost feel again the consuming desire that I had to join it. But they had no use for boys of twelve and thirteen, and before I had a chance in another war the desire to kill people to whom I had not been introduced had passed away. I saw the splendid Hickman in his old age. He seemed about the oldest man I had ever seen, an amazing and melancholy contrast with a showy young captain I had seen preparing his warriors for carnage so many, many years before. Hickman is dead. It is the old story. As Susie said, what is it all for? Rule Gridley went away to the wars, and we heard of him no more for fifteen or sixteen years. Then one day in Carson City, while I was having a difficulty with an editor on the sidewalk, an editor better built for war than I was, I heard a voice say, "'Give him the best you've got, Sam. I'm at your back.' It was Rule Gridley. He said he had not recognized me by my face, but by my drawling style of speech. He went down to see the Reese River mines about that time, and presently he lost an election bet in his mining camp, and by the terms of it he was obliged to buy a fifty-pound sack of self-rising flour, and carry it through the town, preceded by music, and deliver it to the winner of the bet. Of course the whole camp was present, and full of fluid and enthusiasm. The winner of the bet put up the sack at auction for the benefit of the United States Sanitary Fund, and sold it. The excitement grew and grew. The sack was sold over and over again for the benefit of the fund. The news of it came to Virginia City by telegraph. It produced great enthusiasm, and Rule Gridley was begged by telegraph to bring the sack and have an auction in Virginia City. He brought it. An open barouche was provided, also a brass band. The sack was sold over and over again at Gold Hill, then was brought up to Virginia City toward night, and sold, and sold again, and again, and still again, netting twenty or thirty thousand dollars for the sanitary fund. Gridley carried it across California, and sold it at various towns. He sold it for large sums in Sacramento and in San Francisco. He brought it east, sold it in New York, and in various other cities, then carried it out to a great fair at St. Louis, and went on selling it and finally he made it up into small cakes and sold those at a dollar apiece. First and last, the sack of flour, which had originally cost ten dollars, perhaps, netted more than two hundred thousand dollars for the sanitary fund. Rule Gridley has been dead these many, many years. It is the old story. In that school were the first Jews I had ever seen. 
It took me a good while to get over the awe of it. To my fancy they were clothed invisibly in the damp and cobwebby mould of antiquity. They carried me back to Egypt, and in imagination I moved among the pharaohs and all the shadowy celebrities of that remote age. The name of the boys was Levin. We had a collective name for them, which was the only really large and handsome witticism that was ever born in that congressional district. We called them Twenty-Two, and even when the joke was old and had been worn threadbare, we always followed it with the explanation, to make sure that it would be understood. Twice Levin, Twenty-Two. There were other boys whose names remain with me. Irving Ayres, but no matter, he is dead. Then there was George Butler, whom I remember as a child of seven wearing a blue leather belt with a brass buckle, and hated and envied by all the boys on account of it. He was a nephew of General Ben Butler, and fought gallantly at Ball's Bluff, and in several other actions of the Civil War. He is dead long and long ago. Will Bowen, dead long ago. Ed Stevens, dead long ago. And John Briggs were special mates of mine. John is still living. In 1845, when I was ten years old, there was an epidemic of measles in the town, and it made a most alarming slaughter among the little people. There was a funeral almost daily, and the mothers of the town were nearly demented with fright. My mother was greatly troubled. She worried over Pamela and Henry and me, and took constant and extraordinary pains to keep us from coming into contact with the contagion. But upon reflection I believed that her judgment was at fault. It seemed to me that I could improve upon it, if left to my own devices. I cannot remember now whether I was frightened about the measles or not, but I clearly remember that I grew very tired of the suspense I suffered on account of being continually under the threat of death. I remember that I got so weary of it, and so anxious to have the matter settled one way or the other, and promptly, that this anxiety spoiled my days and my nights. I had no pleasure in them. I made up my mind to end this suspense and be done with it. Will Bowen was dangerously ill with the measles, and I thought I would go down there and catch them. I entered the house by the front way, and slipped along through rooms and halls, keeping sharp watch against discovery, and at last I reached Will's bedchamber in the rear of the house, on the second floor, and got into it uncaptured. But that was as far as my victory reached. His mother caught me there a moment later, and snatched me out of the house, and gave me a most competent scolding, and drove me away. She was so scared that she could hardly get her words out, and her face was white. I saw that I must manage better next time, and I did. I hung about the lane at the rear of the house, and watched through cracks in the fence, until I was convinced that the conditions were favorable. Then I slipped through the back yard, and up the back way, and got into the room, and into the bed with Will Bowen, without being observed. I don't know how long I was in the bed. I only remember that Will Bowen, as society, had no value for me, for he was too sick to even notice that I was there. When I heard his mother coming, I covered up my head, but that device was a failure. It was dead summer-time, the cover was nothing more than a limp blanket or sheet, and anybody could see that there were two of us under it. It didn't remain too very long. Mrs. Bowen snatched me out of the bed, and conducted me home herself with a grip on my collar, which she never loosened until she delivered me into my mother's hands, along with her opinion of that kind of a boy. It was a good case of measles that resulted. It brought me within a shade of death's door. It brought me to where I no longer took any interest in anything, but, on the contrary, felt a total absence of interest, which was most placid and enchanting. I have never enjoyed anything in my life any more than I enjoyed dying that time. I was, in effect, dying. The word had been passed, and the family notified to assemble around the bed and see me off. I knew them all. There was no doubtfulness in my vision. They were all crying. But that did not affect me. I took but the vaguest interest in it, and that merely because I was the center of all this emotional attention, and was gratified by it, and vain of it. When Dr. Cunningham had made up his mind that nothing more could be done for me, he put bags of hot ashes all over me. He put them on my breast, on my wrists, on my ankles, and so, very much to his astonishment, and doubtless to my regret, he dragged me back into this world and set me going again. Dictated July 26, 1907 in an article entitled England's Ovation to Mark Twain, Sidney Brooks—but never mind that now. 
I was in Oxford by seven o'clock that evening, June 25th, 1907, and trying on the scarlet gown which the tailor had been constructing, and found it right, right and surpassingly becoming. At half-past ten the next morning we assembled at All Souls College, and marched thence, gowned, mortar-boarded, and in double file, down a long street to the Sheldonian Theatre, between solid walls of the populace, very much hurrahed and limitlessly kodaked. We made a procession of considerable length and distinction and picturesqueness, with the Chancellor, Lord Curzon, late Viceroy of India, in his rich robe of black and gold, in the lead, followed by a pair of trim little boy train-bearers, and the train-bearers followed by the young Prince Arthur of Connaught, who was to be made a D.C.L. The detachment of D.C.L.s were followed by the doctors of science, and these by the doctors of literature, and these in turn by the doctors of music. Sidney Colvin marched in front of me. I was coupled with Sidney Lee, and Kipling followed us. General Booth of the Salvation Army was in the squadron of D.C.L.s. Our journey ended, we were halted in a fine old hall whence we could see, through a corridor of some length, the massed audience in the theatre. Here for a little time we moved about and chatted and made acquaintanceships. Then the DCLs were summoned, and they marched through that corridor, and the shouting began in the theatre. It would be some time before the doctors of literature and of science would be called for, because each of those DCLs had to have a couple of Latin speeches made over him before his promotion would be complete one by the Regius Professor of Civil Law, and the other by the Chancellor. After a while I asked Sir William Ramsay if a person might smoke here and not get shot, and he said, yes, but that whoever did it and got caught would be fined a guinea, and perhaps hanged later. He said he knew of a place where we could accomplish at least as much as half of a smoke before any informers would be likely to chance upon us, and he was ready to show the way to any who might be willing to risk the guinea and the hanging. By request he led the way, and Kipling, Sir Norman Lockyer, and I followed. We crossed an unpopulated quadrangle and stood under one of its exits, an archway of massive masonry, and there we lit up and began to take comfort. The photographers soon arrived, but they were courteous and friendly and gave us no trouble, and we gave them none. They grouped us in all sorts of ways, and photographed us, at their diligent leisure, while we smoked and talked. We were there more than an hour, then we returned to headquarters, happy, content, and greatly refreshed. Presently we filed into the theatre, under a very satisfactory hurrah, and waited in a crimson column, dividing the crowded pit through the middle, until each of us in his turn should be called to stand before the Chancellor, and hear our merits set forth in sonorous Latin. Meantime Kipling and I wrote autographs until some good kind soul interfered in our behalf and procured for us a rest. I will now save what is left of my modesty by quoting a paragraph from Sidney Brooks' ovation. Let those stars take the place of it for the present. Sidney Brooks has done it well. It makes me proud to read it, as proud as I was in that old day sixty-two years ago when I lay dying, the centre of attraction, with one eye piously closed upon the fleeting vanities of this life, an excellent effect, and the other open a crack to observe the tears, the sorrow, the admiration, all for me, all for me. Ah, that was the proudest moment of my long life, until Oxford. Most Americans have been to Oxford, and will remember what a dream of the Middle Ages it is, with its crooked lanes, its grey and stately piles of ancient architecture, and its meditation-breeding air of repose and dignity and unkinship with the noise and fret and hurry and bustle of these modern days. As a dream of the Middle Ages, Oxford was not perfect until pageant day arrived, and furnished certain details which had been for generations lacking. These details began to appear at mid-afternoon on the 27th. At that time, singles, couples, groups, and squadrons of the 3,500 costume characters who were to take part in the pageant began to ooze and drip and stream through house doors all over the old town, and wend towards the meadows outside the walls. Soon the lanes were thronged with costumes which Oxford had from time to time seen and been familiar with in bygone centuries fashions of dress which marked off centuries as by dates, and milestoned them back, and back, and back, until history faded into legend and tradition, when Arthur was a fact, and the round table a reality. 
In this rich commingling of quaint and strange and brilliantly colored fashions in dress, the dress changes of Oxford for twelve centuries stood livid and realized to the eye. Oxford, as a dream of the Middle Ages, was complete now, as it had never in our day before been complete. At last there was no discord. The moldering old buildings and the picturesque throngs drifting past them were in harmony. Soon, astonishingly soon, the only persons that seemed out of place and grotesquely and offensively and criminally out of place were such persons as came intruding along clothed in the ugly and odious fashions of the twentieth century. They were a bitterness to the feelings, an insult to the eye. The make-ups of illustrious historic personages seemed perfect, both as to portraiture and costume. One had no trouble in recognizing them. Also I was apparently quite easily recognizable myself. The first corner I turned brought me suddenly face to face with Henry the Eighth, a person whom I had been implacably disliking for sixty years. But when he put out his hand with royal courtliness and grace, and said, Welcome, well-beloved stranger, to my century and to the hospitalities of my realm, my old prejudices vanished away, and I forgave him. I think now that Henry the Eighth has been over-abused, and that most of us, if we had been situated as he was, domestically, would not have been able to get along with as limited a graveyard as he forced himself to put up with. I feel now that he was one of the nicest men in history. Personal contact with a king is more effective in removing baleful prejudices than is any amount of argument drawn from tales and histories. If I had a child, I would name it Henry the Eighth, regardless of sex. Do you remember Charles the First, and his broad slouch with a plume in it, and his slender tall figure, and his body clothed in velvet doublet with lace sleeves, and his legs in leather with long rapier at his side, and his spurs on his heels? I encountered him at the next corner, and knew him in a moment, knew him as perfectly and as vividly as I should know the grand chain in the Mississippi if I should see it from the pilot-house after all these years. He bent his body and gave his hat a sweep that fetched its plume within an inch of the ground, and gave me a welcome that went to my heart. This king has been much maligned. I shall understand him better hereafter, and shall regret him more than I have been in the habit of doing these fifty or sixty years. He did some things in his time which might better have been left undone, and which cast a shadow upon his name. We all know that, we all concede it, but our error has been in regarding them as crimes, and in calling them by that name, whereas I perceive now that they were only indiscretions. At every few steps I met persons of deathless name whom I had never encountered before outside of pictures and statuary and history, and these were most thrilling and charming encounters. I had handshakes with Henry the Second, who had not been seen in the Oxford streets for nearly eight hundred years, and with the fair Rosamond, whom I now believe to have been chaste and blameless, although I had thought differently about it before, and with Shakespeare, one of the pleasantest foreigners I have ever gotten acquainted with, and with Roger Bacon, and with Queen Elizabeth, who talked five minutes and never swore once, a fact which gave me a new and good opinion of her, and moved me to forgive her for beheading the Scottish Mary, if she really did it, which I now doubt, and with the quaintly and anciently clad young King Harold Harefoot, of near nine hundred years ago, who came flying by on a bicycle and smoking a pipe, but at once checked up and got off to shake with me. And also I met a bishop, who had lost his way, because this was the first time he had been inside the walls of Oxford for as much as twelve hundred years, or thereabouts. By this time I had grown so used to the obliterated ages and their best-known people, that if I had met Adam I should not have been either surprised or embarrassed. And if he had come in a racing automobile and a cloud of dust with nothing on but his fig-leaf, it would have seemed to me all right and harmonious. Mark Twain to be continued.